Hello, everyone. So I'm going to present to you now a conversation and interview I shared with Walter Cruttendom. Walter wrote the book Lost Star of Myth and Time. It's actually one of my favorite books and one of the most fascinating topics to me. This conversation and his work is really about uh, learning about teaching and revealing the reality of our star being a part of a binary star system and that this is actually the cause of the procession of the equinox and relates to what many civilizations spoke about as these different cycles or these great ages that we move through over a 24,000 year period. There are so many gems that we talked about and so many gems brought forward in his work. So check out the description. I share a link to his book, a documentary he put together, um, the conference he does every year and his binary research institute with a lot of scholarly and more scientific articles. Just so if you're interested in getting more into this world of learning about our solar system as being a part of a binary star system, this to me is one of the best starting points out there. Thank you so much for watching and enjoy the interview. Hello, Walter. It is just such a joy to get to meet with you. Feelings mutual, my friend. I've invited you to this conversation you've so generously offered to, to join. And as we are chatting before, really this, this intention is the meeting itself. I don't have much of an idea or an expectation of what we'll discuss or where this will go. I just feel that what you have brought forward in your work um, carries so much meaning on so many levels and it resonates with just personal and collective spiritual evolutionary process and there's so much value in sharing this and talking about this 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 topic so um i i know you've done many interviews and i've listened to many of them and there's oftentimes the almost the necessary recapping of a lot of the the basic rudimentary context and I thought we would start with something that maybe you've, I don't know if you've, you've heard of this. So I'm an evolutionary astrologer. And have you heard of that paradigm? But, no, but I like it because, you know, understanding how things move in the universe gives you an understanding of where things are going, which is sort of the heart of the word evolution there. Yeah. And, and so uh, tell me how that differs from just regular astrology, if you could. Yeah, this is a system brought forward um, from Sri Yukteswar. It was received by my teacher, Jeff Green, um, a good 40-ish year, 40 or more years ago. And the this work is really about looking at the needle chart, right? the map of the planetary positions at the moment, time, location of a person's birth as a way to understand the core soul evolutionary intentions brought into this lifetime. So the basic premise being that each lifetime is created as the result of whatever desires are remaining within the soul, and that this whole life is a template for our ongoing evolutionary growth. So it's, it's a way of zeroing in on the core um, karmic dynamics of the soul that provide the, the why, right? the, the, the underlying soul context for the life experiences that we're having. So pointing everything back to our own awakening, to our own evolutionary growth. And what I wanted to share with you is it, my, my teacher's book, Pluto, the Evolutionary Journey of the Soul. Oh, it's yeah. all about Pluto and how actually Pluto corresponds to the, to the nature of um, the soul's agency to cooperate or resist evolutionary necessity. Right? Um, and the archetype of desire as it relates to that which brings us into incarnation. So the books opened with a quote from Sri Yukteswar, oh. which was, you know, from Autobiography of a Yogi, um, this quote, a child is born on that day and that hour when the celestial rays are in mathematical harmony with his individual karma. His horoscope is a challenging portrait revealing the unalterable past and its probable future result. But the needle chart can be rightly interpreted only by men of intuitive wisdom. Those are few. So, you know, when I found your work and I saw that you were um, drawing so much upon the teachings of Sri Yukteswar, 
I was just deeply touched to find that my life was sort of, um, there's this hidden undercurrent of his teachings and his influence showing up in my world. And so I just wanted to share that, uh, that with you. Great. Oh, that's sweet. Uh, yes, I've been uh, profoundly uh, impressed with Yuktas Fors teachings, you know, first learning about him through autobiography of a yogi when I read that when I was a teenager, uh, so a long time ago in the 60s. And then, uh, you know, originally sir, seeing him as this very stern fellow, because uh, that's his demeanor that that you see initially, I think. Uh, and then coming to realize uh, a deep relationship, you know, with with him and this this whole line of uh, remarkable teachers written about in AY. Where do you feel to start? What's a life for you in, in opening up this vast topic? Do you have a sense of direction? I hadn't really thought about it coming into this call, but since you've mentioned Sri Yukteswar a few times, and that's one of my favorite topics, um, I'd like to, you know, just explore why uh, why he's made the impression on you he has and and your sense of what his mission is and how you align with that mission. And then I'll kind of give you my thoughts on the same thing. I honestly feel completely um, like I'm a little child being carried by something I don't actually understand. Uh, and so the only information that I seem to get from this soul is that he has this um, incomprehensible grasp of the nature of consciousness and its evolutionary cycles, both on an incredibly intimate personal soul level. And I think uh, my teacher, Jeff Green, described him as a galactic astrologer. He understood these greater cycles that I understand the ancients knew about that we're only just now beginning to discover. So anything that Sri Yukteswar ever wrote or ever said, I am immediately impelled to regard with great respect. I just have that inner sense of his soul apprehending the greater intelligence of creation, the, the greater mechanics of how all this stuff works. That's my sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When I first read uh, his book, The Holy Science, you know, it's a pretty deep book. There's this paragraph in there, uh, you probably, in the introduction, I'm sure you know well, it says, according to Oriental astronomy, uh, you know, moons spin on their axes and uh, take some planet uh, and revolve around it. And then planets with their moon, uh, planets also spin on their axes and uh, takes the sun and, and, and goes around it. And so he's giving us, you know, just just simple, basic astronomical facts there. You can't disagree with any of that. And then he says, our sun takes some star for its duel and goes around it in a period of about 24,000 years, uh, which produces the backward motion of the equinoctial point. And, uh, and so when I read that, you know, I'd come to revere this guy because he was right about so many things. Yogananda said so many wonderful things about him also. And um, I thought, here's three uh, correct statements about astronomy. And then there's two incorrect statements, <laughs> according to uh, Western science. And so I was at a crossroads then, you know, is this guy... Uh, wrong because western science sort of disagrees with these last two points here or does he know something that we don't know yet and i kind of had a hunch that that might be the case uh since he was he's such a stellar person and um and so that set me off on a roughly a 25 year trip since i really focused on that and forming the binary research institute and producing the great year film to sort of, you know, just talk about these uh, ideas in a general sense. And then all the conferences we've had and all the scientists we've brought together to really explore these ideas. 
And uh, needless to say, you know, I'm, I'm coming out uh, at the point that he's way ahead of his time. It's it's not just some random incorrect thoughts. It's just uh, remarkable. And I think Western science is getting there. Um, and my guess is within the next, you know, could be a few years, but probably 10 to 20 years at least, uh, these things will probably be fairly well accepted. And so the, um, the idea that we're part of a binary star system, and that's the cause of the precession of the equinox, maybe we can take a moment and briefly explain just the reality of that. So many people who are listening on my channel, you're familiar with the idea of astrological ages and the precession of the equinox. And I'll review it briefly now so we understand what that is. Um, from, a, from a basic sky observational point of view, you can look at the equinox points, either autumnal or, or, or the spring equinox. And basically every year you're gonna find there's a slight precession of the sign that you see rising. And scientists have been asking for a long time, okay, how is that? So we'll get to all the things that we've learned about when we were learning about this in school. Um, but astrologically, this is understood and it's been really taught about from, from for a very long time by many cultures that in each astrological age, humanity is existing within a particular archetypal era, that the age itself defines the sort of the, the overarching nature. And I, I kind of think of it as a Marshall McLuhan type of dynamic, the media is the content, right? You don't know the age you're in because it's the, the, it's the water you're swimming in. It's all encompassing. And, you know, looking at the history of the astrological ages, whatever age we've been in, has always been expressed in the total way in which we've lived as a human species. And there's always that transition point between the ages. So most of us know we're, you know, somewhere moving from the Pisces to Aquarian age right now. And the last 2000 or so years have been the Pisces age, which of course was more or less brought upon with Jesus coming into the earth and all that came with his teachings and the past 2000 years or so. When we were in the age of Taurus, you know, there is a, you'll find all kinds of Taurian associations. And then and I grew up Jewish. And this is just one of, of dozens of correlations that we can find historically that you wrote about in your book. Um, but one simple correlation that I remember thinking about is we have the story of the Ten Commandments. And Moses comes down and all the people are worshiping the golden calf. And, and that wasn't okay. Well, it's because we are transitioning from the age of Taurus to the age of Aries. And we have the, these, these archetypal transition points that reflect different dimensions of consciousness that were prevalent at the time. So what you've really illustrated in your book, and I'll just you know share this with everyone. This is the lost star of myth and time. You wrote it a long time ago, and it's just amazing because it's just, it's been such a profound influence in my life. Um, and what Sri Yukteswar wrote in that short little paragraph is that the procession of the equinox, meaning what causes this backward motion of the zodiac over a 24,000 year period of time is the fact that we're part of a binary star system, that our actual sun, that the entire solar system is moving through space, causing in a perceptual shift in the sky that we're looking at over a long period of time. So I saved you the, the maybe the need to have to say all that, but if, is there anything that you would want to add to that explanation? Sure, maybe just to clarify it a little bit for the layman out there. Um, you know, uh, Copernicus uh, helped set off the Copernican revolution, the Renaissance, the sort of this new age that we're uh, you know, that brought us out of the dark ages. Renaissance means rebirth, rebirth of the cycle. And um, in doing so, uh, he sort of had to rechange the way we look at the universe around us uh, because the Ptolemaic system was widely accepted, this geocentric system. And uh, that, as you know, has the earth in the middle of of the universe, they didn't have concepts for, you know, 
universes and galaxies and interstellar neighborhoods and binary systems and all this sort of thing. They they just said the universe. And um, so he basically had three things to explain. One was, why do we see everything rise in the east and set in the west? And uh, he science had reached the point that they were starting to realize that these objects that move around us are really very, very far away. And for them to all be moving completely around us every day, they'd have to be going at incredible speeds. And so he, of course, brought back the old Greek idea that, uh, no, the earth turns on its axis. Everything doesn't go around a stable earth, but rather uh, things rise in the east and set in the west because the earth is turning from west to east. Really simple. And so it took a few hundred years, but people signed off on that. And then uh, the second thing he had to explain was, you know, why you see the sun. Um, uh, if you watch the sunrise, it's rising in a different constellation. Why does it rise through the 12 constellations of the zodiac, which is a, a commonly used reference frame for the last you know, 3,000 years since the Babylonians at least, probably goes back much farther. Um, and he said, you know, does the sun really move? He had just stopped the sun from moving by saying that the earth spins. And so he had to kind of stop it again and said, no, the earth actually goes around the sun, uh, which was this Greek idea. He was familiar with Aristarchus of Samos. And so he's just bringing back that idea, cleaned up a little bit with a little more math. Uh, it had been lost for about 2,000 years. And so, yeah, as as the Earth goes around the sun, we're seeing a different 30 degrees of sky each month. And so it was very logical. Uh, and people, again, bought off on that, too, after a few hundred years. Uh, and the third Take thing we had to explain was the sun moving again. But this time, if you only look at it on the equinox, the sun... Is, is moving backwards, retrograde to its its normal motion that it moves during the year, during the calendar. And it's it's only moving by about 50 arc seconds, you know, a degree every 72 years or so. But nonetheless, this was well documented, going back to at least Hipparchus, but probably before that. Um, there's a couple of books on that. And so he's the only th thing he could think of since he couldn't have the sun actually moving, the, remember he wanted to establish the sun as the fixed center of the universe. And, um, and he didn't have any place for the sun to move to. And so he said, the axis itself must be wobbling a little bit. Right. And that, that is why the equinox will actually happen at a different point in the Earth's orbit around the sun each year. The equinox would actually be slipping by 50 arc seconds per year and therefore, you're going to naturally see different stars behind the sun, if you will, uh, you know, if you look just on the equinox. And um, and it would take roughly 24 to 26,000 years at its current rate to, to make that backward circuit. So it was really a pretty clever uh, explanation he came up with. And then, of course, uh, uh, he didn't explain why it happened, why the Earth's axis wobbled. So that was sort of left to Newton a few hundred years later, who had been discovering laws of inertia and physics and, and things like this. And um, he said, you know, it must be the sun and the moon tugging on the Earth. We know that the sun and the moon influence the tides. So if they can slosh the water around, surely they must be able to move the axis 50 arc seconds per year. And um, but as you probably know, his equations never really worked. They didn't predict the rate of precession. Uh, actually, uh, the precession's accelerating, and yeah. his equations kind of predict that they would uh, it would decelerate if anything, because mm -hmm. these objects are slowly moving away from us, slowly having less gravitational pull. And so people tried to fix them, you know. Uh, all all sorts of folks uh, from Urbain Le Verrier to, you know, Simon Newcomb in the year 1900. And they all added in things. And finally, you got to 
thousands of inputs, you know, not only all the planets and all the meteors and all the, all the comets, but atmospheric effects and things like this. And it just got to the point where the precession equation was so complicated, it was just left up to a few people to, to work on, figure out. And, um, and, and then, you know, roughly in the early 20th century, People didn't even need precession anymore. Ships could navigate uh, better with uh, radio and and then you know radar and then satellites and computers and and so it turns out that in the modern world precessions just who cares if it's not perfectly accurate you know it's so it's off a little bit nobody needs it anymore yeah. um, and of course this is in opposition to so many ancient writings, uh, particularly those mentioned in um, Hamlet's Mill by Giorgio di Santiano and Hertha Foundation. And they document, you know, roughly 30 ancient cultures that are tracking the motions of the heavens mm. and, and talking about just what you had mentioned, that there's different, they talk about how life on earth is different uh, in different ages, you know, when a different... Uh, zodiacal sign is dominant um, and there's all sorts of tales about them you know jason and the argonauts what are they going to find they're going to find the golden fleece that which is worn by Ares. you know um, and so many 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 tales about it and so the uh, juxtaposition between the ancient thought that these the motion of the, the processional motion really affects the the ages and the modern thought that it has nothing to do with anything it, it couldn't be more opposed <laughs> and that's that's kind of where we are uh today and and that's what makes it a juicy problem in my uh, opinion you, you you illustrate quite clearly why the solar lunar theory which is basically the general idea that the wobble proposed wobble is is created by some sort of sun moon gravitational pull why that can't be and, and one of the clearest arguments is it doesn't really account for um movement outside of the solar system meaning it that's just happening locally to the earth so we need something that actually ac accounts for the entire solar system moving through space would you speak more to that uh yes yes so um there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, procession, if you will, relative to local objects. However, the, nobody measures procession relative to local objects because they all have too much motion and procession's a real fine mm -hmm. motion anyway. And so the way we measure procession nowadays, as you know, is with very long baseline interferometry, uh, these satellite dishes that are picking up signals from quasars outside not just the solar system but often outside the galaxy so you know the farther something is away even if it does move the less it's going to move relative to us because we're so far away from it uh and so that's why they pick these these points um and so yeah that's it, it's uh it's a it's sort of a technical uh tell that something's wrong with the procession theory if it's if it's not working locally. But people would challenge that. They said, you know, there's too much noise locally, and and so you know mm -hmm. they just don't want to get into it. But there is one relatively easy uh, proof about that. And try to get your head around this for a second. So, and it's basically the moon that's giving us. Uh, the information we need. So as you know, the the moon goes around the earth as the earth goes around the sun. And uh, when the earth has completed a 360 degree motion around the sun, you will actually have exactly uh, one more time that the earth is, the moon has orbited the earth than the actual full moons that you see in the sky or new moons, if you want to use that as your marker. 
Sure. And, and the reason for this is, is, of course, the number of times the moon orbits the Earth and the number of full moons you see would exactly. be exactly even if the Earth didn't curve through space. If the Earth, if it was just the sun, the Earth, and the moon going around us, that, that number would be even. Right. Right. Because the Earth goes around the sun at the same time the moon goes around us, by the time it completes one circuit, there's going to be this delta of one. Yeah. And in fact, when that delta is 1.00000, when it's exactly one, we know that the Earth has gone exactly 360 degrees around the sun. And that point uh, is, is an equinoctial year, which Copernicus doesn't say outright, but he implies in all the loony solar precession equations imply that it can't be 360 degrees because they say that the star shifted because the earth went around the sun 50 arc seconds short. That's why you see the stars all shifted 50 arc seconds. And so they need the equinoctial year, the tropical year, which we base our time and calendars on and all this sort of thing, uh, to be less than a 360 degree motion. And so, you know, it's it's an absolute slam dunk mathematical proof that you can't deny. And there's another person that just wrote a paper on it. But it's, it's a, such an obscure thing that people think procession doesn't matter. You know, very few people are really interested in in this kind of work. Right. Well, it, it 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 absolutely amazes and humbles me too to recognize how easy it is, even within the credible scientific community, to for the human mind to sort of sequester some some holes in in the logic and say, well, it doesn't really matter. Um, and, and where that quest for insight and knowledge and truth just sort of falls short because we often are just not curious enough to really question the very premises that we're just assuming to be true, even if it's illogical, even if it's very clear that it doesn't sound, it doesn't work. And and this is where we come back to Sri Yukteswar and all of the ancients. And I, I think the scientific community is like on that cusp, which makes sense for where we're at in terms of just the age that we're in, what's growing. We're just on the cusp of beginning to recognize that there's a whole way of thinking about this human experience and this this life and this earth and what's going on here from a completely different reference point beyond what we've assumed to be true. And you know, it, what we're gonna speak about the, the ages and what the yugas are about in a moment, um, but what humbles me about this perspective, a part of the teachings here are that we often assume that human consciousness is sort of growing, you know, on a typical, uh, I forgot what the scientific, you know, a, a straight line. Linear. Uh, linear, right, linear growth. And it's, and what we find, and, and it looks like that if you just think on a certain level, well, you know, we didn't have these smartphones and these computers, and clearly we've become more technologically and sophisticated and we have more health advancements. But when we take a broader step back, we actually realize there was a more subtle understanding um, and, and knowledge and trust and alignment with the intelligence of creation, something that's so, so much more intricate and intimate to the nature of things that we've lost touch with. And, you know, David Hawkins writes this idea in his book, um, what was it, Power Versus Force? Have you heard of that book? Right? The, the difference between power versus force. We have to take the minerals from the earth. We have to manipulate resources um, and create a lot of waste to have the amazing technological developments that we have today. It, it seems like such a great thing that we've done, but actually it's not that great. And I think this points to um where as a human species we're on the cusp of realizing we don't we don't know as much as we think we do there's a completely other frame of reference out there that we're just beginning to appreciate within the scientific community and i just wanted that's why i'm excited to have conversations like this with you and other people in in similar realms because i'm so passionate about spirituality and spiritual awakening 
and being able to bridge that that interest with our scientific knowledge of the world just has a lot of meaning to me. So I, I totally agree. Uh, but your main point there that um, there's the four different ages, and we'll just use use those because. Uh, you know, it simplifies it. And there's a lot of subtleties and gradations in between, of course. Uh, but I like the language that the Greeks used. They, they broke it in the iron, bronze, silver, and golden age, as, as you know. And so, yes, there's all this tales and myth and folklore and ancient wisdom that we knew much more in the higher ages, the golden, silver age, and and then lost much of it as all these great civilizations from ancient Egypt to ancient India, to, you know, everywhere around the world uh, declined. I mean, you look at just Mesopotamia, it was Sumer, fantastic, incredible uh, civilization, uh, falls to Akkad, which falls to Babylon. Babylon is still great, famed hanging gardens, you right. know, municipal sewer systems. By the time of the Dark Ages, it is just nomads hanging around the ruins, you know, intense, or they're taking the the bricks uh, to to build mud huts. Then it's things have fallen so far, and yes, the outer technology is just a, a just a, a a signal of of the consciousness, uh, but it's the actually the consciousness that has fallen. It's not just something's come along and destroyed everything, and 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 we're actually just as smart or smarter, you know, we'd build it, put it back together. But since consciousness itself has fallen, you know, Egypt was at its height at the very beginning. By the time of the Dark Ages, they couldn't even build an arch anymore. It was mm. just incredible. Wow. You know, the Great Pyramid was the largest structure on Earth for 3,800 years at least, um, assuming it was built when they said. Uh, but anyway, these things fall down. And so the the ages, uh, the way the Greeks uh, discuss it, and of course the Indians give us much more color, but it's basically that this Iron Age, the lowest age, is when mankind only uses his five senses. And, and he can only perceive things he can touch and feel and smell and taste, etc. And um, he has no knowledge of finer forces, uh, molecules, cells, you know, uh, molecules are made of atoms, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, electrons, no knowledge of electromagnetism, electricity, uh, you know, subtle forces, radar, or whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's as if it doesn't exist to him because he can't perceive it. And then of course, we came out of that age, you know, with the Renaissance and, and we discover all these things. Um, but you're right, it's nothing close to a straight line, linear. Um, at, at first, it's just a very slow uh, mm -hmm. progression. If you look at the time between, say, Copernicus, he wrote De Revolute Onibus in 1543, and um, Sri Yukteswar, who writes, you know, in 1894, The Holy Science. So there's 300 plus years. Uh, Yukteswar is saying in his book how the world is advanced. You know, it's now covered with telegraph lines and with railroads and things like this. And, and so it seems like, wow, it's really advanced since Copernicus's time when they have no idea of telegraphs or sending electric signals through the air or steam engines and locomotives. And, and, uh, and so he calls it, you know, these are space annihilators. They're Mm. things can go faster and, and transcend more space in a shorter period of time. And now you look at the time eight, between 1894 when Sri Yukteswar writes, and today, you know, a little over, what, 130 years roughly. And uh, man, the, the inventions have been incredible, you know, much faster pace than 350 years between Copernicus and Sri Yukteswar just in the last, you know, 120, 130 years. And so, yeah, I don't think it's linear. I think it's accelerating 
at an exponential kind of rate, just as the procession rate exactly. actually moves faster and faster each year. Yeah. Uh, and we can hardly even imagine then the future, what the, what the silver age might be like. So we've gone from the sort of known history is, is this iron age, the reality you perceive only through the senses to this bronze age, when you have a knowledge of finer forces and you begin to use them and come up with all these inventions, you know, like jets and the internet and all sorts of things. And then um, the next age, of course, is supposed to be uh, the silver age when they say that telepathy is once again, common knowledge. You know, right. Right. you wonder why writing doesn't appear to the year. There we go. Yeah. 3000 BC. It wasn't required. Yeah. yeah. We look for evidence of physical advancements as a sign of intelligence, but it's almost the opposite. The further we've moved from knowledge of the inner reality, the more we've needed to substantiate our existence with things to do with things. <laughs> and, and we've just consumed our, our lives with uh, ways to to represent our intelligence and our capacities with the things of this world and and what you're sharing teaches and points to um what all of the teachers say that the world the universe everything exists on the inside and if that's true i mean if that that's that deep if that's a, if that's true the um, the intelligence on the inside and the the knowledge of reality that's potentiated on the inside is um, immense. So it seems like that up that uh, that accelerated arc upwards is really more of a movement towards self realization. And as you, said, as you said, it's an evolution of consciousness. And I think the world tends to because of just the nature of the world, we tend to think externally, like what are the technological developments? And it's really not about that. It's it's in, it's internal awakening. And that's what these yugas, that's what these cycles of consciousness are all about. It's, it's true. Uh, although in the current age, as you know, um, it, it's still a material age. And although we're aware of finer forces and, and therefore we can create more and more gadgets, uh, we're still still into creating a lot of gadgets and material stuff and you know who knows what uh what horizons we can reach it's going to be pretty incredible because this goes on for roughly two thousand years till we're yeah. sort of you know in the uh in the to treta yuga proper the silver age yeah. uh when supposedly much of this this kind of stuff just falls away because it's not required anymore. You know, we don't need the technology intermediary to communicate. We're just in tune. And so, yeah, I was, who was I talking with the other day about some ancient sites and how they're so pristine, these early, early sites. And it's remarkable that they don't leave any symbols on them. Uh, you know what we would call writing, and uh, if they do, it's it's very simple sorts of things, and I think they're they're full of information, but we don't know how to pull it out yet. You know, because we we're in the age where we need things spelled out for us. You know, if not phonetically, at least graphically, <laughs> and of course, if we're right about evolution through the ages, then our intellect, our intuition, will, our consciousness will develop so profoundly that we'll probably, the stones will literally speak to us in, in ways we can hardly comprehend right now. And this really inspires me, just the importance of cultivating silence. Because um, this really seems that the, the mysteries of our human potential and our evolutionary tra trajectory are found in subtler and subtler being and less with all that we're trying to fill the space with all the things that were you know it reminds me of ramana maharshi he was pressed to teach a meditation technique and he didn't really have a technique you know he said silence is the teaching 
but if, but if you need something, and then he he taught about contemplating who am I. Um, but but he that was more so because people really wanted something. <laughs> His real teaching was silence, and um, that reminds me about faith. That reminds me of the importance in my life, in our life, of cultivating space to be quiet, because that's I think where the deeper knowledge and the deeper teachings come. So, for those that aren't already familiar with how amazing this is, will you will you give us a, a little? Um, taste of just how we know ancient civilizations um, knew things about reality that we still haven't even figured out, um, that we see expressed all over the world at the same time period in, in what we know about these civilizations. Yeah, so I, I've been moved by a couple of books. You know, there's so many authors uh, be before me. Schwaller de Lubitz wrote The Temple of Man and uh, a, f a few other books. He he lived in Egypt for a while. He was he was a mystic, and so really came to understood the the high wisdom of ancient Egypt. Um, and so there's some terrific books there. And of course, there's many uh, modern uh, researchers, investigators. You know, from Christopher Dunn to Graham Hancock, and and um, you know, Jimmy Corsetti and all, all these guys that that look at look at these things and then from an engineering standpoint or uh, historic standpoint and 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 they're slowly uncovering uh, this idea that ancient man might have been a lot smarter than we give him credit for you know and so yeah somewhere through the dark ages uh, you know we. We lost a lot of ancient knowledge, of course, as we discussed. Many of the the sites were ruined, um, and then when we came out uh, in the Renaissance, you know, we're trying to explain why are things sort of evolving now. And uh, Darwin uh, comes up with a very logical theory about evolution, and I, I do think evolution makes a lot of sense over the long term. But they almost interpret it religiously that mm. there's no room for any any loops or cycles or you know and we know we have the cycle of day and night and we have the cycle of the seasons so maybe there's a greatest cycle too that that have ages but um this this primitive uh, this idea of darwinism right now is anything that came before us must be more primitive with rare exceptions you know uh and so it's it's almost interpreted as i say religiously um, which hides or masks uh, many of the great uh, discoveries and knowledge of the ancients. And so another terrific book is, uh, you know, uh, Hamlet's Mill. I mentioned written by Giorgio de Santiana. He's the professor of the history of science at MIT and Hertha von Deschen. She's a very accomplished anthropologist. And they get together in the 1960s because they're trying to discover the origins of science you know what a great project for a professor of history of science and um, and so they need to read all these old books to try to find out you know where did math and science first come in and they know that they have to go to even to older books scriptures and then to older things, myth and folklore that was maybe passed down orally before it was written down. And of course, in doing so, they find out that a lot of uh, these ancient cultures are talking about the motion of the heavens and tying them to different ages, just as we're talking about. Uh, and so he, he realizes that they're aware of procession. They don't call it that, of course. Um, but it's not just uh, one culture, it's many cultures are tracking this, the motions of the heavens and attaching different conditions of the earth. You know, the Nordic might call these different ages the Axe Age, the Wolf Age, uh, the Ice Age, things like this, very colorful mm -hmm. terms uh, versus something completely different in the Polynesian Islands. And so... Uh, I think a lot of these scholars have been 
finding out this information for a long time that ancient cultures knew more than we give them credit for, but it hasn't been accepted into the mainstream because it didn't fit the Darwinian paradigm. Anything that came before us must be more primitive. And so our, these artifacts they find, say the Antikythera geared devices, you know, it went down in the shipwreck uh, in the Aegean Sea in the BC era, you know, over 2000 years ago. And geared devices weren't developed until, you know, the great clock making era of, of Europe. And so we have to sort of change our, our narrative. Okay, you know, it was really developed then, but there was a couple of one-offs, you know. Right. 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 Or the battery, you know, Volton yeah. gets the battery in the year roughly about 1700 or something. Uh, but then they find bab batteries in Babylon and, uh, you know, optical lenses, it's, all these things. But they they just kind of keep putting them on the shelf as anomalous artifacts, a couple of one offs, um, not realizing that, you know, mankind was really pretty smart in the ancient past lost a lot of its knowledge and then went through a pretty rough dark age and uh, things are back on the upswing again uh, so yeah i think you just need to read uh these terrific books that are out there and have an open mind thankfully you know there's so many wonderful researchers now presenting at uh, conferences like ours a conference on procession and ancient knowledge or all over the internet now so you can uh, really find a lot of information. And it's it's causing archeology span and some of the mainstream sciences to kind of address these things. Just one in the paper today too, about this uh, Indonesian site uh, supposed to be a pyramid, you know, that far predates, uh, you know, the great pyramid or the earliest Egyptian pyramids are only 4,000 plus years old. And these things they're saying go back like 20,000 years. So wow. it's, it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. Wow. And uh, the more they find these things, the more they'll have to come up with them. So right now on this new one in Indonesia, which actually is uh, mentioned in the first episode of Ancient Apocalypse by Graham Hancock. It's on Netflix. Oh, cool. um, that's the one that they've just done the redating on by Indonesian architects. And they don't quite... Uh, have the party line of the Western, I'm sorry, of the Western archaeologists. And so uh, it's it's really a fun time in the world today. So, I mean, what I'm hearing from that is there are, anytime I've listened to anything on this topic, it just, it seems there's an increasing number of um, data points around the technological, geometrical, structural, astronomical knowledge that preceded our time that just far more in comp it's, it's undeniable at this point how encompassing and widespread this greater knowledge was a long time ago um yes so and the lidar too uh, I, I what? probably know uh this uh the way they can now use lasers uh flying in uh airplanes or drones or things like this yeah. and do ground penetrating uh things they're discovering vast civilizations. For example, they recently took large pictures of um, Guatemala and Southern Mexico, and they realized that the, you know, the Mayan culture is much wider and much older than they previously thought. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not just a couple of places in the world. It's now turning out that the entire world was really quite advanced long before the dark ages. So let's pivot now to the binary star theory. Um, everything that we've spoken about, the basic astronomy being what's actually keeping the solar system moving through space is it's joining with another star. And, and so will you explain the basic astronomy of how does a binary star system work? And I would love to hear um, if you if it's ready to be spoken, you've written an article about it, but I would love to hear the, the, your current research and musings on what that star might be. Right. Um, so we began looking for this, you know, when we realized that Sri Yukteswar was right about the cause of procession. So 
So if he's right, then what is this other star? Because he never identifies it in his uh, in his book. Um, and so, yeah, that's when we formed the Binary Research Institute 20 plus years ago and, and hired, uh, you know, uh, astrophysicist Anthony Leon helped us, a mathematician, Vince Days, a couple of guys to help us model, uh, Jeff Petito, John Chan. And um, we built various models. And of course, in that process, yeah, we're looking at everything we can about binary star systems. And it turns out, you know, when Sri Yukteswar was talking about it in the late 1800s, um, they were not thought to be very common, you know, maybe a small percentage of stars that appeared to be double stars when we used good telescopes to look at them and watched them carefully. It turns out one star is going around the other. And, um, and since our technologies improved the, the, percentage of binary systems out there and it, it could just be binary but it might be trinary or you know four or five or more um but uh the latest uh estimates by the chandra website are close to 80 percent so you know i like to say that stars like relationships as much as people do you know they're what did the Greeks call stars gods, you know? So maybe there's some truth to these tales. I don't know. Um, so yes, they're quite uh, prevalent out there. And and so the big question is, you know, is our, does our sun have a companion star? Uh, because of course we've all been taught that no, it doesn't. Uh, there's, there's no obvious candidate for it. Uh, and, and that, these ideas were developed before we really had a great understanding of brown dwarfs, red dwarfs, black holes, all these different uh, things that are very hard to see. Um, and, and so, yeah, we started this uh, search and, and what's, what's key to, to really understanding here is, um, let me just say that when I talk to other astronomers, they say, you know, if we were in a binary star system, then our sun itself would be moving through space. And of course, if you understood precession, then the sun is whipping through space. It's going 50 arc seconds per year. Like roughly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And maybe there's a couple of arc seconds um, that the earth actually wobbles. I, I don't doubt that, but it can't be much more than that just because of the lunar equations I mentioned to you, they just don't allow for much more. So the bulk of the sun's motion across the sky, which we all see with our own eyes is real. Uh, we can't just uh, say it doesn't exist because of uh, the current theory of precession. Uh, and so that's the one of the main things that's holding people back. Uh, as long as they have, have the old idea of precession, they're really not gonna look for any binary system because this, they don't think the sun moves. Uh, and then the second thing they would say, okay, if we do have a companion star, uh, you know, it would have to probably be our closest or sometime in the near future, our closest star. Um, and yeah, we do have a, a candidate that, that fits that now. And then what else would they say? Oh, that star would probably be moving faster than any other star in the sky and if we look at it it's probably coming straight towards us yep. <laughs> and, and so they they built all this criteria but of course no one was looking for anything for a long time and pretty much still isn't because they don't think the sun itself can move and we're not in a binary relationship uh, that started to change a little bit uh in uh, roughly you know 20 16 or so, 2017, uh, when uh, Mike Brown at Caltech, he wrote the book, uh, How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that book. But Mike Brown and, and his uh, associate there, uh, Kim Batigen, Constantine Batigen, are two astrophysicists that began to find a lot of other Pluto-sized planets. Right you know, Sedna and 
things like this. And I think they're up to like sweat, seven major dwarfs now, starting to sound like a snow white tail. And um, they're, uh, as, and that's why they had to rename Pluto, reclassify it as a, as a dwarf planet and with eight classical planets. And then, so they started watching all these dwarfs and they noticed that they're almost all inclined to the plane. You know, Pluto's inclined 17 degrees, I'm sure you know, and, um, and these others are too. So the farther out you go away from the sun's gravity, the more things seem to bend a little bit. So that's kind of interesting. And the next thing they noticed was they all have a very uh, eccentric orbits, you know, long elliptical orbits. And then the most fascinating thing they found, which really set off alarm bells at Caltech and other places, was they all have their the perihelions, the closest approach to the sun on one side of the sun. <laughs> And they just began to think that something's going on. You know, there's got to be something influencing them. And that's when the the worldwide search for Planet Nine started, you know, sort of officially in 2017, I guess. And now they it's, you know, going on seven years, eight years or so that they've been looking for something. And at first they were kind of all convinced there's got to be a Planet Nine out there. They had a location rough location, you know, a third of the sky picked out where it, it should be. And um, and with all the fine equipment we have nowadays, they're unable to uh, to find a, a planet nine. And, and But it's encouraging to me because I, even though they can't find it, at least they realize that there's something that's affecting our solar system that's dragging all these planets. They've even dug up some old information, uh, such as, you know, the major planets themselves are pulled down about six degrees. Huh. Uh, and so... Below the ecliptic, you mean? Yes, yeah. Uh, is it the ecliptic or it would be the sun's equator? Yeah, the, the ecliptic. Yeah, below the sun's equator. Okay, different than the ecliptic. Okay. Yeah. Versus, you know, if the, if our system was formed by an accretion disk and everything goes like this, all this dust and gas and cools and makes the planets, and that's the best theory they have nowadays, uh, then everything should be on plane pretty much with the spin axis of the sun. Right. And um, if things are off, then there's a reason for that, you know. And, and so... Uh, they, there's a lot of reasons they're looking for an object out there, but they haven't found anything so far. And, and just to recap what you're sharing, the the this deviance from the plane and that they all share the same perillion, they're all kind of bending at the same point. Like there's something, some sort of big gravitational force that's affecting all of these trans-Neptunians, all these outer planets or bodies. Right. Or and um, I, I just want to repeat one thing you shared just to kind of build this for everyone's mind. You, you spoke earlier that we've learned that the precession rate is increasing. Correct. Right. So that says whatever is causing this precession, this movement through space, um, if it's a binary star situation, it, it must mean we're getting closer to it. Exactly. Yeah. That's how Kepler's laws work. You know? Yeah. When, you know, even the even the Earth going around the Sun, it's not a perfect circle. It's it's mm. slightly eccentric, mm -hmm. um, and its close point is roughly ninety one million miles, and its far point roughly ninety five mil million miles. And when we're ninety one away, the Earth is moving a little bit faster um, because the gravitational pull is a little bit stronger. And you know, when it's its farthest point, the Earth Earth moves a little slower. It all averages out to the same, you know orbit period but everything works like that uh when the gravity is stronger things move faster and so yes the uh the candidate star that we've found and i want to put some caveats in there that i i think there's multiple influences but but there's probably one you call the binary and then there's and then there's some bigger things happening on a longer term scale that actually even influence that 
Um, but yeah, the best candidate we've found is a star called Bernard star. And it is, um, um, it wasn't even known in, in 1894 when Street just War writes the Holy Science. And maybe that's why he didn't give a name. You yeah. know, he just said, the sun takes some star for its duel. Nor was Pluto. <laughs> right. Yeah, good point. That was the 1930s. But uh, uh, it was discovered in 1915 by E.E. E. Bernard, I think it was official in 1916. And... Uh, People had caught it on plates before that, but he was sort of the first one to really uh, point it out. And then as people watched it for longer periods of time, they began to realize how fast it is moving. And it's now known as the fastest star in the sky, a runaway star, if you will. And so the the best theory is that um, something you know must have come close to it in the not too distant past, five to 20,000 years and gave it a great uh, gravitational kick. Mm. Um, and so that's that's the best guess. And a little bit more about that. So it's, it's a red dwarf. It has about 70% of the sun's mass, which would mean when they come close, if they are gravitationally bound, the center of mass uh, it's a pretty straightforward equation. You just basically add the two and then divide. And and so it being only 17% of the sun's mass, that center of mass is going to be much closer to the sun than it is to Bernard's. And that's important because the sun then doesn't have to go that far or move that fast to create its precession of motion. Um, it's, it's actually within a light year. So right now Bernard's is about six light years away, uh, 5.95, I think is the latest estimate because it's coming closer to us every year. Um, we had been looking at it for a while, it was just identified in the last 18 months or so that it will soon be our closest star. Um, this is by mainstream astronomy out there. The current estimate is it will get as close as 3.85. And so you average that out, six now, 3.85 is close point. We use about four and a half to then calculate the center of mass. And that's how we get to the center of mass being less than one light year away, actually less than three quarters of a light year away. Oh. And so that really make, makes all the, all the math work because our sun really doesn't have to be going much faster than we think it's going right now. And, um, you know, it'll speed up a little bit and slow down a little bit because Kepler's laws. Mm -hmm. And um, likewise with Bernard's, we already know it's the fastest star in the sky and it doesn't have to speed up much more. Uh, and so it, it all really works out uh, well. And indeed it is coming straight towards us. There's even an article on the, internet now that you know will bernard's hit our sun yes. yeah that's what i'm seeing <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun it's uh uh so people are beginning to take notice and of course i don't think it'll hit our sun because of this gravitational effect you know it'll it actually whip around us as as we're going around the center of mass at the same time and yeah it, it really looks like an excellent candidate for a lot of reasons um but it's probably you know there's a bigger thing going on um it, it appears that you know our our son and sirius have some longer term relationship and oh, so okay. in smutus war stuff he points out that you know besides this binary relationship um there's also some point he calls vishnu nabi and as we get as our binary relationship takes us closer to that point, that's when you have the higher ages, something happens to affect life on earth. And then as we go farther away from that point, we're in the lower ages. And so uh, I haven't figured out what that bigger motion is, but it, it's going to mean that a straightforward calculation of just Bernard's itself uh, might not fit all the criteria when we're done, but it sure looks 
really good from everything we're seeing right now. Okay. Sort of the coup de gras, if you will, is uh, uh, it's, they, they've been, you know, watching Bernard's calculating it, uh, mainstream of astronomy, and, and calculated its close point to our Earth. And of course, three Euctus Wars, you know, and the Holy Science written in 1894 said this other star will uh, has its far point in 500 AD here at the depth of the Dark Ages. Had its last close point, you know, 12,000 years before that, 11,500 uh, BC, you know, sort of the, the height when uh, Salone is talking about Atlantis, you know, and all that sort of thing. And then the next close point, perihelion, periapsis, would be in about uh, 12,500 AD, right? And mainstream astronomy just came out and said, uh, Bernard's will make its closest approach in 11,800. Oh, interesting. AD. So it's within 3% of the orbit period mm -hmm. of the 24,000 years. When I read your article on this, on the Binary Research Institute website, and I'll put all the links for everyone down below. Um, I was like, so excited to learn i'm very very amateur astronomer so i wanted to learn more about bernard start every single um almost every single video or article that i came across spoke about its eventual and possible running with the earth and it, and it it sort of surprises me that i have not yet come across any video any article postulating the possibility of us being in a binary system with bernard star and again, I, I guess I can just appreciate that this is just a tendency for how slow it is for us to accept ideas so out of the frame of our conditioned thinking. I, I'm very curious if if nobody's could, even even looking, you know. Yeah, yeah. It fits Seriously. all the same. It, it fits so many criteria from what you shared. It's accelerating, okay. Um it's getting now that that's a key point, you know. Yeah. Think about that for a minute. So the reason people say it moves so fast was because it came close to something in the last, you know, five to 20,000 years. Um, it would have to be slowing down then. Yeah. So it would give it a kick and it could still be the fastest moving star in the sky, but it would then still be decelerating. Yeah. And that latest paper I saw, yeah, it shows that it is actually accelerating. That means whatever is pulling Bernard's, it is getting closer to. And if you look in this lo local stellar neighborhood where Bernard's exists, there's not many things. Mm -hmm. We're one of the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's us, in my opinion. And that it's going to become the closest star, surpassing the current closest star system. It, it, there's so much evidence speaking to this possibility. Um, I, I am there is, there is a little argument yeah. there. You know, they, they, these things, they plot them and it takes time. But uh, some say that uh, the current closest stellar system, Alpha Centauri, as you know, Alpha Centauri A, B, and Proxima Centauri, which is currently only 4.4 and 4.2 light years away. Um, uh, will also be coming a little closer at the same time. And that's yeah. why I think there's this, a bit of a net effect. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. But it's hard to see how that one would be having the the effect uh, like Bernard's is having, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, one thing I'm hearing from the humility of, of not trying to fix, um, this is it, we got it figured out. <laughs> Um, it's just in the ongoing recognition, we're only just now beginning to reapproach the possibility of a binary system. And that, if I think about just how we've evolved in our model of the universe from being purely geocentric for a while, and then considering the possibility of moving around the sun, and then considering the possibility of the sun moving, it, we still want to keep open to grasping the larger you know, just like what else is happening out there? Right. Yeah, it's important to keep that humility um, and not fix our minds in, in certainty beyond. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's it's fun that as 
as our consciousness expands, we look at things a little bit differently. So, you know, when most of us went to school, uh, they taught that the solar system is this flat thing. The sun's not moving. Everything goes around it. You know, there obviously there's the orbits are a little eccentric, but not too much. And then just in the last 10 years, you're seeing a lot of these videos uh, on the Internet that show this, you know, the sun moving and the planets going around it. Mm. Uh, and so it, it gives us a whole different view, different reference frame of how things move. And I'm sure that will continue to expand as we uh, as our consciousness grows. So. Walter, thank you so much for taking this time to have this conversation and, and to just share this knowledge with everyone watching. I would love to know if, is there anything else you want to share? And the question is, what's most meaningful and, and alive for you right now in this learning process, be it scientifically or spiritually, what, what is most real that you would want to share with us? Uh, so kind of going back to the very beginning of our conversation, what shall we talk about? Uh, to me, you know, that discovery that, uh, that Sri Yukteswar talked about in 1894 in his book, The Holy Science, which is just brilliant. Uh, it's been a real outlier out there because it, it sort of went against Western science. And so, I'd like to see not only the science uh, really ferreted out so we understand that he's probably right about uh, most of this stuff, but for that information to kind of get into the mainstream um, so people can just have a better understanding. Because if you, even subconsciously, if you don't know your place in time and space, I just don't think you're as balanced. And I, you know, look at the world now a days you know most of us really don't understand our our deep history uh, and we a lot of people just think you know we're going from caveman to modern technology man that's just going to blow himself up you know so i just think that it's so important to have this greater knowledge of ancient cultures ancient wisdom this bigger perspective and the way we look at things and and so, yeah, that's what I'm focusing on is getting that out there through more books and videos and podcasts. And uh, we're working on some more films uh, right now, too. Oh, cool. So there's a film. It's uh, it's on YouTube. You can also buy it on Amazon, narrated by James Earl Jones on The Lost Star, on the binary star theory and all of the content in the book. I'll post that in the link. You, you have a conference that one day I would love to attend. Um, you have a free ticket whenever you can make it out here. Yes. So. Um, yeah, every year it, it, it's happening for several years. You've, you've been doing that. And we're all all the people that are just talking and thinking about this stuff get together. Um, sounds like one of the most fun things to do. How can those who are interested and, and inspired by this topic, how can we give back to this evolution and to this discovery and to this learning right now? What are some ways we can be a part of this or engage? I think meditate. <laughs> the more people meditate and, you know, grow themselves and we all become better beacons and uh, there's more light and, you know, higher teachings can be accepted, you know. Good answer. Yeah. You know, you look at the problems in the world nowadays and, uh, you really can't solve them from somebody coming from the outside and say, you two shall make peace and we'll, mm. you know, we'll separate your tanks by so much space. You, know, you solve them by everyone that lives in that land changing and become little lamps themselves. So. You know, that just brings up for me this, this piece shared earlier. Um, thinking about this, like the spiritual impact for me in just having this conversation and learning about this provides, a, to use an astrological term, more of an Aquarian, the Aquarius archetype corresponds to the, the nature of witness or witness consciousness. Um, it, it provides more of a, a broader impersonal 
perspective and a little bit of a, a separation from the immediacy of the human experience and um, provides a little more peace and stability on the inside. Our interview got cut off short, so we'll end it here. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, share your comments, share your thoughts. I would love to see what arises for you in, in joining us in this conversation. And I'll just close by sharing with you an image. This is a diagram from The Holy Science by Sri Yukteswar, um, where he describes the, the, the astrological ages as they correspond to these yugas, to these great cycles of time. Now, in the Indian system, the reference point is actually the autumnal equinox. So right now we would say we are transitioning from Virgo to Leo as opposed to Pisces to Aquarius. So hopefully this image is clear for you. Once again, thank you for watching and much love.